As the high-end dining scene in Mexico City has been growing, well, by extension, so have the city's culinary schools. Their mission is to help produce the new generation of chefs, working in the restaurants of today and hopefully creating their own restaurants in the future. Here at Instituto Culinario Coronado, like at culinary schools all around the world, they teach the basic techniques from France and Italy, but their main concentration is teaching Mexican cuisine. Now that may seem obvious at a culinary school in Mexico, but it hasn't always been the case. And the students are being taught that you must master the flavors and techniques of the past before attempting to reinvent them. <laughs> Chef Gabriel Moro gave me a tour of his class of traditional Mexican cooking. Here the students were preparing a traditional dish of pipian with shrimp. The students learned to grind the pumpkin seeds on a traditional stone metate. They're ground to a paste, combined with tomatillos, hojas santas, onion, garlic, chili, epazote, and even a little touch of vanilla. Onions are fried in lard, tomatillos are added, and then the ground pumpkin seed paste is combined to make the pipián, all done by hand and without the use of a blender. Outdoors and over a wood fire, the students make fresh tortillas to finish the dish. Now those tortillas go back onto the comal. They get brushed with a little bit of lard and sprinkled with some fresh ground pumpkin seeds for serving. The pipián is ladled onto a plate, followed by the cooked shrimp. And finally, Chef Moro adds some beautiful, fresh epazote leaves as a garnish. Students here aren't limited to learning just the traditional dishes either. In what they call their creative workshop, they're being taught the techniques of the modern Mexican kitchen as well. From the handling of little microgreens to expressive plating methods, students here are learning how to create dishes worthy of any high-end restaurant's modern menu. Chef Diego Nino plated a dish for me that beautifully illustrated all those elements. He started with a bean paste that was dolloped onto the plate with a squeeze bottle. Some roasted wedges of chile coyote squash went onto the plate, followed by some very small roasted potatoes. Next, he added a few rolled up pieces of raw chile coyote. That was followed by some blanched fava beans. Then he added a couple of fried chocoyotes. Those are like dumplings that are made from corn masa. Some purslane was then added as a beautiful garnish. <laughs> Alongside, he plated a puree of purslane as well, followed by some beautiful squash blossoms. A filet of pork was tucked in next to the vegetables, and finally he topped it all off with a washmole sauce made from the seeds of the guaje tree along with costeño chilies, tomatoes, tomatillos, hoja santa, and masa. It's bastante sutil. <laughs> no es una salsa muy agresiva. Sí. El costeño es un chile bastante <laughs> bravo. <laughs> no, este es fantástico. One restaurant that takes full advantage of these talented young culinary students is Raiz on the north side of Mexico City. Now, Raiz is one of the most beautiful and contemporary restaurants in the city, and it has a stunning urban rooftop garden. What makes it truly unique, in my opinion, is that the restaurant is almost entirely staffed by students from the Coronado Culinary School. Overseen by acclaimed chef Arturo Fernandez and a handful of sous chefs, the students and staff are creating some amazing dishes. One of the most dramatic is a soup that they call Oro Negro. They start with a traditional black bean soup that's strained into a gourd for serving. Then they take this special cheese preparation and literally pump air into it like a balloon. The ball of cheese is placed in a serving dish, which is then infused with smoke. 
And when it's served at the table, the cover's removed, allowing all that smoke to escape. Then the hot soup is poured over the ball of cheese and it all melts into one of the most dramatic presentations you'll ever see. One of the most popular dishes on the menu at Raiz is Arturo's version of beef tongue. Y pues esto es básicamente una receta de, de, de mi abuela que ha sido heredada por mi familia. To start, he cooks some tomatoes, garlic, onion, and olive oil. Next, he adds some broth. And then he adds a couple of guero chilies and some parsley. Eso es, para mí, eso es muy español. Cuando yo veo estos chiles en un sí. platillo. A ver si es de, de mi abuela, pero muchos es base de cocina española, que se ha adaptado muchísimo en México. Sí. Nosotros eh, conocemos las aceitunas, las alcaparras, porque fueron traídas a, a México, entonces estuvo como muy difundido y pues, se ha quedado muchísimo en la, en, la, en la cocina mexicana y es lo que, lo que hacemos. After it's cooked down, it's blended into a sauce. Then the whole beef tongue is wrapped in maguey leaves and steam cooked in pulque for 18 hours at 160 degrees. Then it's cleaned, sliced, and placed in a vacuum bag along with the sauce. Tengo una pregunta. Sí. Este es un restaurante de alta cocina. Muy bonito, platillos buenísimos. ¿Cómo es trabajar con una cocina de estudiantes? Pues yo, la verdad, es la única forma que conozco. Eh, tengo 22 años eh, trabajando en esto y desde hace 15 años he trabajado con puros alumnos. Entonces, eh, Cada área tiene un subchef y él es el responsable de enseñarles. Y nosotros los vamos y viendo. Y asegurar que lo que están haciendo es exacto, perfecto. Exacto. Yeah. Y si le dicen, hazme la misa en plaza del conejo, los chicos van pesando, midiendo todo. Ajá, y ajá, el subchef yeah. es el responsable de hacerlo por lo menos la primera vez. Sí, sí, claro. Para que ellos mismos. Y se vaya. Y se va heredando. Sí, sí. Se va heredando. Y hay un momento en el que el que estaba más adelantado se Ajá. tiene que marchar Ajá. y van avanzando. Ah, sí. Entonces se ha hecho un, un ciclo. Ah, y me ciclo. imagino que los mejores estudiantes de la escuela son los que están trabajando. Ahora. Los subchefs, yeah, sí. que ya, ya, ya son empleados, por sí, decirlo sí, así, sí, claro. fueron estudiantes. Ajá. Y han estado todo el tiempo aquí con nosotros y ellos son los los que ahora me ayudan. Somos cinco los que llevamos sí, sí, sí. toda la cocina. Muy bien. When it's time to plate, some more of that sauce is poured on top of the lengua, and then he nestles in a wedge of potato. He garnishes the plate with black olives, capers, and some fresh herbs from their rooftop garden. Casi casero. <laughs> sí, intentamos. Mm -hmm. ¿Te acuerdas un momento cuando decidiste quiero ser chef? Sí. ¿Sí? ¿Cuándo fue? Tenía yo nueve años y estábamos en la cocina de, de la casa de mi mamá uh -huh. y mi papá me estaba grabando y yo estaba haciendo una receta. No. no. Un, 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 ¿Nueve años? Un huevo revuelto. Y siempre me metí en casa de mi tía, de mi abuela, de mi mamá, a la cocina. Perfecto. No, muchas gracias, chef. Mm. Fantástico. Gracias. gracias. While the beautiful plating and advanced techniques that Arturo uses wouldn't necessarily be considered traditional, this dish, which is the most popular one on his menu, has roots in his family kitchen. Tiene otro sabor como ahumado. Totalmente ahumado, sí. It's here where his mother and his aunts have been preparing a similar dish for years that Arturo learned not just how to cook, but the pleasures in cooking. Mm. ¿Qué tal, gordo? Muy bueno. Muy bueno. ¿No le hace falta sal? Nada. And that thread that ties the traditional to the modern is what he aims to teach his student chefs every day. <laughs> Thank you.
Tonight at our restaurant in Chicago, we're serving a private dinner for a small group of guests in our library. And I've asked a couple of the culinary students who are apprenticing with us to help prepare and serve the meal. So tonight we have six people coming for dinner here in the private dining room. So we're just going to make a small batch, but uh, of a kind of mole. And it's a very easy one for us to step through because I want to get us all the way to the end so that I can talk to you about how you season a mole. Because to me, seasoning a mole is one of the most important things. So first of all, of course, we got to do the mise en place for it. So I'm going to ask you, Hector, just two ancho chilies. I want you to clean those and get those ready. Uh, about a quarter of one of those onions, a couple cloves of garlic peeled and, and chopped, if you'll put those together. And Anna, uh, will you roast and peel, uh, let's say, three of those tomatoes that are there? And then I need you to grind some cinnamon and grind some allspice and then chop up uh, half of one of those things of chocolate will be enough. Perfect. Okay, thank you. You guys can go ahead and get started. Usually when you're making a mole, you toast the chilies, either oil toast them or dry toast them uh, as one of the very first steps. Because there's not a lot of chili in this particular recipe, we're actually going to do that together with what most people would consider the second step, which is to saute onions and garlic. So I'm going to ask you to take your onions and your garlic and start that in some oil. I've got some oil set out there for you. Um, medium heat with those pieces of ancho chili right in there. So just enough oil then to cover the bottom of the pot. We're going to use this pot again when it comes to simmering the mole. A mole that's made with untoasted um, chilies is just not going to have the depth of flavor that we're looking for here. So keep those in contact with the bottom of the pot as much as possible. Let's check the tomatoes now. Sure. I think they should be ready. Yeah, I think those are good. Nice and soft. That's Perfect. what I'm looking for. And then um, we'll let them cool for a second and then just peel the top off. And then I want you to chop them up. Over Perfect. There. Yeah. You see how they're starting to change color? They kind of lighten up on that inside part. That's when you know that they've toasted enough. That gives you that really beautiful, toasty ancho flavor. Let's scrape everything from your pot, the onions, garlic, and the anchos into here. Anna, I need you to measure, again, I'll say it's small quantities here, but just a quarter of a teaspoon of the allspice, half a teaspoon of the cinnamon. The chocolate we're gonna leave till the very end. Okay, right in the blender, right? Right into the blender. Okay, here's a cup of Roasted peanuts, drop that in there, followed by your tomatoes or pieces of white bread are going to go in there. I'm just going to tear them up so that they'll be easier to blend okay. up. And our second chili that's going to go in here, we're going to put two chipotles. You want to put two sure. of those guys in there? about a cup and a half of chicken stock just to get it blending. Okay, top goes on, blend, and then we're gonna put it back into this pot. And we're gonna film the bottom of the pot again with a little bit of our cooking oil. Now, when that gets really hot, we're going to press it through this so we've got our strainer. Yes, that's exactly what we wanted to hear. Okay, so we'll stir it now until it gets thicker, darker, and all of those flavors have fused together. 
Okay, it looks considerably darker and thicker to me. So let's say pour about two thirds of that broth in there. We can always add more a little bit later on. So then just mix that in. I'm gonna turn the temperature down to about, well, between medium and medium low. Anna, can you grab that chopped chocolate? Yeah. And let's add that to the pot. All of it, right? All of it, yeah. We're going to let it simmer now. Half hour is good, hour is better, several hours is best. <laughs> but we're gonna let that simmer for a little while while we go on to the rest of the preparations for tonight's dinner. So these are what they call glove boned quail, meaning that the bones have been taken out of the inside. And the legs of the quail are gonna cook slower than the breast of the quail. And I wanna make sure that our guests tonight have really beautifully done quail breasts. That's the best part of the quail. So why don't you cut the legs off and then Anna, for each one of them, you want to fold that last wing tip under. And so we're going to grill it just mm -hmm. like that. Um, then we're going to drizzle it with olive oil, sprinkle them with salt, and then grill them on this pan until the legs are completely tender and the breast is just barely done. One of the critical ingredients that's going to go in the dessert that we're going to do is plantains. And so I've kind of collected from the box downstairs all <laughs> different stages of ripeness so that you'd have a chance to see exactly what that is. Because if they're not ripe enough, they don't taste sweet like a plant, like we're thinking a plantain's going to be. So if you use green plantains, anything like this, it's going to taste just like the potato. Once they start turning yellow, then they start to sweeten up. But if you want really sweet plantains, then these are the ones that you would choose. Now, there's just a traditional way to cut them. So I'm gonna do this one. Um, I always slit it down the side because the skin of a plantain can be a little bit tougher than a regular banana skin. So pull that open, then the traditional way to cut the plantains always is on the diagonal, certainly the way that everybody in Mexico does that. So Hector, I'm gonna let you go ahead and cut the other two. We need three of them all together. And then at the same time, I'm gonna take some butter over here, heat a skillet so that we can fry those. Okay, so high fire underneath this one. just lay them in there, the slices in there, in a single layer. And it will take them about three minutes or so per side if we've got the right temperature on the fire. They're beautifully golden. They have a almost caramelized look to them. I like to do them in butter. That smell of plantain cooked in butter to me is one of the most delicious things in the world. So grab one of those quarter sheets and um, I'll just let you take those out sure. of there. And we'll, then we'll go on to the next part of the dessert making. Now this is a, a pan that has a non-stick coating on it and you want to give it just the tiniest little bit of butter in here. If you put too much, this, this whole method won't work at all. This is just a regular old crepe batter. And I'm going to pour some batter in there and then we're gonna tip the pan around and then pour off the last of the batter. Anything that will come out will come out, okay? At this point, we have a very thin, even crepe across the base of it here. And I'm going to use a spoon to even it up like that. And then this just becomes the snacks for the <laughs> chef, okay? And we're gonna let it uh, cook until it releases itself from the pan. Flip that over. Nice light brown on that side. So that's what we want it to look like. Are you ready to? To try? Sure, yeah. Okay, I thought you would be. <laughs> okay. Okay, shake the pan. There it is. Now slide it right out onto the other ones. Perfect. Next step is to butter the crepes, and you want to liberally butter them on the most beautiful side. 
Then once they're all buttered and stacked together, flip that stack over and fill them one by one. Lay a few slices of that beautiful golden plantain right in the middle. Put some chopped chocolate over that and then roll it up like you'd roll a burrito or a blintz. Lay that on a baking sheet that's lined with parchment paper and then sprinkle it all with granulated sugar. It's time to plate. We've reheated the quail in the oven just to warm it through. That's all, just a kind of 300 degree oven. Same thing. These are little, what we call nuggets of greens. Those are made from Swiss chard with just enough custard to kind of hold them together. After they cool down, you can cut them into those beautiful little shapes. Then I rewarm them again. And I have a puree here of the Mexican white sweet potato, the camote, the one that's purple on the outside. And I'm gonna start by plating this with just a little of that and then making a, a little swoosh. And what this plate is all about is the sauce, of course. So we have some of our mole, the cacao thing. Drizzle over this. A few peanuts over and around the plate, and perhaps a leaf or two of flat leaf parsley. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I want to introduce the two assistants. We have a lot of culinary students that do apprenticeships here. So we have Hector and Anna that worked with me uh, making the meal for you folks tonight. And what we made for you is um, one of the simplest moles, but it has all the complexity of flavor. So it's called a mole de cacahuate, or a peanut mole. Um, and it's got a little uh, ancho chili in it and chipotle chili and thickened with peanuts, of course, and then all the spices and so forth that go into making it a complex mole. It's gonna be beautiful with the wine that you have in your glasses, I know that. Provecho. <laughs> when you're ready to serve, those plantain and chocolate filled, buttered, and sugared crepes, slide them into the oven. You want the oven to be at about 400 degrees. And let them crisp in there and brown. That'll take uh, five, six, seven minutes. When they're golden, bring them out and serve them with cajeta. That's that goat milk caramel that's so famous from Mexico. I like to put a little spoonful of ice cream beside it, vanilla is delicious. If there's any leftover crepes, slice them up and fry them until they're crispy. Put those on top and then sprinkle the whole thing with powdered sugar. 